You're listening to The Real Wealth Show with Kathy Fetke, the real estate investor's resource. These last few weeks have been very eye-opening for those of us who saw a police officer murder someone in broad daylight with cameras rolling and onlookers demanding that he stop, but he didn't. This, of course, triggered riots and protests across the country. And our guest today is somewhat surprised at the reaction because he says police brutality has been a way of life for centuries. But he says that didn't stop him from getting out of rough neighborhoods in New Orleans and building a successful real estate company in Indianapolis. I'm Kathy Fetke, and welcome to The Real Wealth Show. I have spent the last 15 years interviewing inspiring people who have built success from the ground up. I figure if one person can do it and show the way, the rest can follow. Well, today's guest is one of the most inspiring people I've met. He was raised in rough neighborhoods in New Orleans, where he focused on basketball, and that earned him a scholarship to college, which he later applied to investing in real estate and flipping homes. And today, he owns a property management company, buys and flips, buys and holds, and helps us at Real Wealth Network find properties in Indianapolis. And I think you'll enjoy how he found a way to create massive success, even in one of the most challenging environments. And he's here to share his story with us here on The Real Well Show. Well, Mike, welcome to The Real Well Show. Thank you. Thank you. It's, Proud, it's uh, really nice to see you. I feel like we're, we're almost having human contact, but, but not really. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Human contact has a lot more value these days. Yeah, Absolutely. Well, let's see. The last time I saw you, I believe, was February. And a lot has changed since then. A lot. So I would love to uh, just kind of start out and hear your story of how you got where you are. I mean, you're, you're, uh, you've got a growing business and we're so happy to be working with you. So how did you get there? Okay, well, um, started started off um, back in about 2009. Um, we were looking into getting into something that could produce um, long-term cash flow. Um, and I um, met a guy in the neighborhood at the uh, actual at the um, the um, clubhouse where we lived at. Uh, we worked out worked out a lot together and stuff. And he was a uh, real estate investor. And um, I spent about three to four months with him, learning the city, uh, learning the neighborhoods, learning the areas. Um, learning what 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 um, properties work well for us um, long term for long term cash flow, what areas would work well, things of that nature, um, and uh, we started investing in, in, in single family homes in Indianapolis. Um, a little bit after that, learning with him, uh, started buying homes for the sake of cash flow. Um, jumped right in, uh, started building up my my, my rehab crews. Um, you know, getting all of my different connections from HVAC guys to um, general contractors that, you know, do framing and just all the different aspects um, that go into investing, um, learning the right areas and things like that, that we really, that was really important to us for the sake of ensuring long-term cash flow. Um, and so that kind of, that kind of, we did that for probably about four or five years. Um, and then it came a point in time where uh, we were looking to do a cash out refinance with a bank um, and got in touch with the management company and was trying to, you know, get, you get you, it was about 40 properties. So we, I wanted to do five appraisals a day so that we can get it done in about two weeks. And uh, the management company had a lot of problems with getting in touch with the tenants and things of that nature. Um, and so um I took the, the the initiative and started going to the houses myself to, to 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 reach out to the people and kind of find out what was going on. Um, that's when I learned how important the role of management was in the um, bridging the gap between owner and tenant. Um, mm-hmm. I was getting some reports from tenants about things that we were not aware of, um, things that were not being taken care of the way that we would like them to be taken care of from an investor standpoint because the whole intent was to ensure long-term cash flow. So there are certain things that we would like addressed when things come up instead of people having to call health departments or, you know, go other measures because they feel like they're not being heard or being attended to. So that made me understand and realize how important it was for property management. So I decided to start my own property management company. Wow. Oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> That's amazing. 
So, so we started our own property management company. Uh, we, we built a portfolio of about 140 houses, um, started our own property management company, um, and um, had the idea of offering the same service to, to other, you know, other investors with the mind frame of the investor in mind. Um, and it, it kind of grew from a property management standpoint into uh, we manage now about 480 properties. Wow. Um, and now we're basically taking the philosophy that we use to build up our own portfolio and um, offering it to clients like you guys have. Oh, yeah. That's what a story. All right. So let's go back to the first days you're at the gym, you meet someone who's a real estate investor. Uh, how, like, how did you do It's so valuable to have a mentor. I mean, did he just kind of show you the way or JV, JV, JV with you? That's exactly right. Um, mm -hmm. He kind of showed me the way. I was very intrigued because of the, the asset preservation that it provides and then also the cash flow that it could provide. So he um, was, was very deep into, into real estate and I was just very willing to listen and learn and also put the work in. I was willing to. So you were um, helping him. That's why he was kind of helping you basically. Yes. Yes. We went into, yes, we went into business together. So the first 20 houses that we bought were his. Okay. Um, so it was his, I was, I was going to ask you, where'd you get the money? So it was his money. No, 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 no. It's not his money. So I had a, um, a movement company and then my cousin plays basketball, well, played basketball for the Pacers. Mm -hmm. So um, Dan, that's Danny Granger. He, that's my first cousin. And um, the idea was that we were looking for something to put the money into to build up the portfolio. So we bought all of the properties with cash. Okay. So you were helping your uh, pro uh, cousin uh, invest money. Correct. And, and discovered real estate as a great option for that. That's so great. I can't tell you how many uh, times we have picked up foreclosures from ball players who just didn't know how to manage it or, or uh, you know, spent their money incorrectly, invested it incorrectly. So how did you end up in that position to, to help with the finances and help with the investing? Well, that, that would probably go all the way back to the relationship between me and my cousin. Um, that's a very unique relationship. We grew up in New Orleans, Louisiana. We played basketball together. He's four months younger than me. Uh, we went to college together. Um, so we've always been very, very close with each other. Um, always um, had, a, had a business mentality, even while being athletes, I guess, um, just from the way we were raised by our parents and stuff. Um, and so when we analyzed the deals and spent time with the guy, like I said, we spent about three to four, I spent about three to four months with him um, learning and uh, making sure it was something that we wanted to do. Um, and so, um, you, you know, eventually you have to take the, take the, take the leap and, and, and go and do it. And um, that's what we, that's what we decided to do. And, uh, that was that was really just just it, just going with our gut and um, just doing it, just being partners like we've been for for life. Just you know, just, wow. just me. It, it, it wasn't uh yeah, it was just natural for us to, for us to, to 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 do something together. Um, and he's still involved with your company. Oh yes, absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. I spoke with him yesterday. He's investing in Arizona now, also. So I'm doing things here. He's doing things in Arizona. Um, we're still we we still own five different entities that are holding that we uh, hold properties in, um, in one management company. Um, so we're still still going strong, still building um, the portfolio. We do a lot of flips now, buy houses here in Indianapolis and sell them on the market to investors. And then um, you know we also have the company where we buy properties and sell them turnkey. I mean, I meant sell them to homeowners. Sorry, we do flips and sell them to home individuals that want to move into their homes and then we also have the turnkey business that we do where we sell properties to uh, investors and clients like yourself that yeah. have clients like yourself i mean that's that's extraordinary i mean how many how many pro athletes do you think get that mindset that they need to take their money and invest it to make more money versus those who just spend it and it's gone yeah a lot a lot of them do that 
Um, and it, I think it also, you know, a lot, it, it, Danny is very, he's always been uh, very, very smart. He had an offer to a scholarship to go to Yale, which they don't give athletic wow. scholarships. They only oh give my gosh. Scholarships. Mm. So he, he's always been, um, I would just say naturally athletic, athletically gifted. He's six, nine. Uh, we grew up where all we were really taught was playing basketball and playing sports and, we kind of had a lot of boys around and, you know, that kind of environment that we grew up in. But um, we also understood that that's still being paid from someone and that it's temporary and um, that you would want to try to turn that into something that could last much longer. And um, you need to put the work in. And just like you become a professional at basketball, you have to put the work in to become a professional at something else. So, um you know, a lot of hard work and, um, and, 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 and staying focused on what really matters and not getting caught up in, in just the things that money can kind of bring you, you know? That, that is such an important mindset. And it, it's like to, to consider taking the money, buying an asset that then generates more money. Uh-oh, did I lose you? There we oh, go. I'm back. Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, to take your money and buy an asset that generates more money and then spend that instead of your original investment. I mean, that's the whole idea of cash flow, but that is not something anyone is really taught in school. So the fact that you guys grasp that is really incredible. I mean, did, were you taught that from your parents or it was just intuitively? Not at all. Um, <laughs> not, re not really. Um, they taught us work ethic. They did teach us work ethic, but they, they um they knew you know just mainly work you know what I mean like you go to work you get off you you know you the easier route you know um we kind of just took it to another level um we have always wanted to own businesses or do things take advantage of the opportunity that basketball get, gave us um and we um wanted to do it wisely because it, it, you have to be careful. It's not smart to just go and invest kind of loosely with things because people can lose money. Like you said, that's how yeah. a lot of people end up being foreclosed on. But the main thing that we did was we were hands-on with it. I feel like a lot of athletes can't be hands-on because they don't have somebody that can be hands-on with it to know what's going on. So you're so so the person that's involved in and taking care of it doesn't have any skin in the game and they're not taking it as serious as the athlete really would take it. And the athlete is yeah. playing the sport, so they don't have the time to really oversee it. So by the time, you know, it gets, uh, the things come out, it's so far down the line. So we watched the video, um, the guy sent over a video and we were talking about it and it kind of gave a breakdown of how a house can work, how uh, depreciation works, how somebody that makes that much W-2 income, how depreciation is much more valuable to somebody that has that much W-2 income because you can write off a lot more more things to save on your on the taxes that you have to pay so a lot of the stuff just made sense when we watched it and we've and it was something that we felt like we could do um initially passively we didn't do it with the intention of starting a property management company initially it was to be passive they were managed by like i mentioned earlier another management company so initially it was just for passiveness and um having me here uh, once, once things kind of needed to, to get going and stuff, I've, I've always taken the, taken the lead or taken the first step, right? Sometimes that's good or bad, depending on what you're jumping into, but I've always jumped in. Um, and so just being so hands-on and, um, and making sure you're on top of crews, just make, I mean, it's, it's a lot that goes into a business, which is why a lot of times athletes probably run into problems with it because the people that are running it don't have the same, um, intent or same seriousness that, that, that needs to be put into it to to kind of make it happen so we just committed to it stuck to it and and and, and um put the time in did our research did our due diligence learned educated ourselves about how different things work and um and uh that that's that's pretty much it uh it's brilliant i mean that's one thing i never quite understood is why i would want to give my money to someone who's making fees whether they make money or lose money for me you know either way they make the fees it just didn't make sense to me they did not like that. I, well, I, I just said, I didn't. They advised against it, right? The, the, the question you get all of the financial advisors and things of that nature that kind of tell you. But after, what's funny is after a while, they actually, um, uh, the people that were advising against it now uh, love it. Um, 
Oh, they so, were advising you against real estate? Yes. And I bet they're investing with you now. <laughs> yeah, they love it. Yeah, they, they send clients to us sometimes. <laughs> or try to. Oh, okay, that's amazing. <laughs> that's amazing. All right. Uh, so tell me about Indianapolis today, because we went in in 2009 and we're going, buying houses that on streets that were just lined with boarded up houses. It was really rough. We would, uh, you know, once you take the boards off the house after you bought it and, and foreclosure, boy, you never knew what you were getting inside and it wasn't pretty. Um, that was 10 years ago. I mean, are you still finding foreclosures like that or has, has everything completely changed? There's still those properties that are out there. We we've never really invested in those in those areas where a lot of the streets are, is kind of boarded up. Like I said, our whole mind frame was more um, safe type of investments as as much as you can say with real estate. So it was built around single family homes, mm-hmm. homes that had a minimum of like three beds, maybe a bath, to, uh, maybe a minimum of bath and a half, had an attached garage or a detached garage, something that lent itself to was a family wanting to stay. It was important for the houses to be in township school zones. Indianapolis has a lot of good schools in the townships school zones. A lot of people want to have their kids in those schools because the schools are better. So we wanted to have houses that were in those areas because we would get a person that cared about the schools that cares about. It's a better chance they're going to care about their families, it's a better chance they're going to care about how they live, care about the house. So we didn't have a lot of um, properties that had, you know, two to three or four units in them with people living on top of each other and potentially having uh, pest issues and noise issues and uh, and growing out of the out of the space kind of quickly. So we we really focused on um, a certain area or, or criteria a house that fit toward what we were looking for. And even in areas that were a little bit below it, um, if it was in on a good street, you know, we the screening process for tenants was very important. The quality of the rehab was very important to get to attract somebody that really, you know. Um, wants to be in the home mm-hmm. um, that's one of the biggest things that, that that we've created with our management company is a a, um, a demand people 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 wait for our properties they 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 um they want to rent from us because of the pride that we put into the house and because of how we try to take care of the tenants but also hold them accountable for what their responsibilities are and what they have to do and understand that each side should do what they are supposed to do and, and that's the only way that it can work. So um, Indianapolis does have a lot of those areas still where there's a lot of boarded up properties. And, um, and those are just those are just tougher areas. You know, I don't, the, um, what's the proper word? I don't um, defer or tell people not to, to go in those areas. That's just not what we do. Mm-hmm. Um, the houses are built in 1900. They're, they're huge. They have, you have foundation issues in some of them. It's just a more difficult process, and then to get a person in and stay in, and, and you know, so that was like I said, um, we were from a position where safe made more sense, mm-hmm. and so we kind of went along with that philosophy just from the beginning. You know, instead of putting carpet, we put LVP, luxury vinyl plank flooring. You know, if a house needs windows, we go in and replace the windows. If it needs a roof, we replace the roof. If it needs a furnace, instead of putting in the furnace that has that that will force the tenant to have a super high electric bill, but it's a little bit cheaper, we put in a little a furnace that's a little more efficient. You know, just certain things that kind of give you a better chance of um, accomplishing what you're set out, what you're setting out for. And it wasn't to, you know, try to crush it per se. It was more so to maintain assets and 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 and, and just generate um, generate generate cash flow. Mm-hmm. What price points do you look for? I mean, wh- how do you choose a neighborhood and what <laughs> price point? And then what what's the kind of after repair value and then rents, how the rents compare? So the price point is um, um, houses anywhere from about, I would say the low end is about 60,000. Um, high end for rentals in our main portfolio is probably about 120,000 to 100 and maybe 30,000. And that number is only because that's where the, the, the rent ratio to the purchase price kind of keeps up the best. Once you get up to around 150, 50, 160, 180,000, you know, the rent kind of drops, you know, a little bit from that 1% that you may be looking for. Um, as an example, if a house that we would have that's worth 90,000, we might be able to rent it for $1,000, 1100 
as opposed to a house that's 180 grand, it might rent for 1500 or 1600. Um, on those houses, those are ones that we would flip potentially and put them on the market and sell them to an actual homeowner because there's also neighborhoods where more people are buying houses in. Um, but our main rental price point is anywhere from 60 up until about 130,000 on the, on the, on the top end. And that, and that here in Indianapolis is a solid house, you know, yeah. and uh, you're getting rent anywhere from 600, 650 up until about 1400. Um, wow. 1400 for a house that's 120,000. 130. 130,000. Yeah, 120, I would say about 1,200 to 1,250, yeah. And how's rental demand been? Rental demand is great. Um, that's the one thing that over doing this for 12 years, I've, I've not really seen drop. Um, it's actually a more of a demand now, but that's only because the availability has went down mm-hmm. or the auctions being canceled since March. So our inventory level has not been nearly um, the amount that we would normally have. So the demand seems to be even more, but the demand is steady. Um, we put properties on the market. There's applications for them within the first few days. And normally out of that group of applications, we're able to pick someone um, within, you know, a week to two weeks. That's amazing, isn't it? So yeah. I haven't really thought of that aspect that because the courts have been closed and there's been no um, foreclosures or evictions, People like you who generally, do, do you buy your properties at auctions or? That's correct. The majority, that was, that was the majority of, of the sourcing, yeah. And so that just stopped? That just stopped. Indeed. So do you do anything else? Bandit signs or MLS? Oh, yeah. MLS? We do MLS. Yeah. We, do MLS. Uh, we, we, we work with a lot of wholesalers around. Um, the auction was just one place where you could go and there's 120 properties that are getting auctioned off and we had a chance at, you know, have a mini met the criteria so that was just a good uh selection to to choose from and you know you could go there and get you know four properties maybe 10 properties you know so that was the beauty of the auction is that it had more immediate results um kind of the attention that indianapolis got made it a little bit harder to acquire properties other ways because a lot of the people here um even a lot of a lot of the wholesalers and a lot of my board a lot of people started selling to outside of the state investors because it was a lot easier to um, to sell properties um, to those individuals because they they you know it's I'm looking for a certain thing I'm I, it's a little I'm a little bit I'm a little harder probably looking yeah. as a criteria that I'm looking for for myself than somebody that is is out of the state so it got a little bit harder um, you know from wholesalers and stuff because their marketing went toward out of state investors interesting because, because they could sell because they could raise the prices range of prices and raise the prices and sell a wider range of prices i mean of properties you know um so yeah, see, a lot of people don't realize that when when they go through our network that they're getting a better deal and going on their own because they it's just so easy to take advantage of a californian like we just don't understand values we don't know the yeah. difference between an eighty thousand dollar property, one hundred twenty thousand dollar property, or even one fifty. So we rely on people like you to tell us the truth, and um, and so if you're able to get it cheaper, it gives you more leeway to fix up the property and make it nicer. And so we pay, we pay maybe what other people are paying, but we're getting a fixed up property, and they're maybe not if they're just. That's right, and yeah. that's the great value that you guys really bring through your vetting process and through the. Um, group that you guys have put together. I was very impressed when I first met you guys and uh, we joined the group just because uh, you get so deep in your own business and everything. And it's refreshing to um, step back and be around other people that you, you could tell you guys have went or went, have really put a lot of time in to go out and find quality uh, vendors or suppliers and people that really know their areas, know their markets, have strong business models, have plans in place, you know, have all of the things that you really need in order to, to do it um, and do it at a high level and do it the right way, not just sell anything um, and sell paper basically. So that's why I, w- I was, I was impressed with the process and the, uh, the real well members are getting a good, great value from the um, diligence and the vetting process that you guys have implemented. Thank you so much. I just, I love it when we all get together and, you guys all share your best practices with each other and everybody just 
is able to improve their businesses learning from from each other. So right. it's been fun. Um, all right, well, let's talk about what is going on right now. In over the last three months, we had businesses shut down, the economy stopped. Uh, we've had you know a pandemic, and then shortly after, uh, we've had riots. I imagine you had riots in Indianapolis. I mean, how how has the market changed, or has it changed because of uh, what's happened over the last three months? Well, man, 2020 has been interesting, I'll tell it's you. Been it's been a year, <laughs> a year to, for the history books. <laughs> it has been a year. Um, it's, been, uh, it's been a lot of adjustments. It's been a lot of um, extra work to kind of try to get the same results. Um, mm. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, but it's been, it's been a, 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 a interesting, a, kind of like a fun challenge for, for me, I, I feel like, or for us, it's, it's allowed... Um, me to focus on other areas that that kind of can be strengthened. Um, we've been able, we've been informing the tenants of what the expectation is ever since March kind of hit. So we we haven't seen a, a a significant drop off as far as rental income is is concerned and things of that nature. We try to update them on what programs are available, um, what the government is offering, and different stuff like that, just to make sure that they understand that. You know, you can't come up and just say, hey, I can't pay rent because of this, because of this reason. Uh, we stress that, you know, where somebody lives is the most important thing. And as tough as times are, you need somewhere to live still. Um, and, yeah. you know, even though rent and evictions are being um, delayed, the, the money is not forgiven. So it's, uh, it's a little bit of just educating and communicating with people and just trying to make sure they understand they need to do what, do what they can um, do what they can do. You know, um, we were a central business, the, the COVID um, hit and we, we kept rolling. My team wanted to keep rolling. We understand what our role is. Um, and I even educate them on the connection that, you know, a person that's living in a house that's paying $700, you know, um, those are the people that really are, are potentially running and, 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 and fueling a lot of things that go on behind that, um, depending on how that house is funded at the, at, on the back end. Um, so, you know, they, they're, they're more important than, they're, they're, you know, they need to be treated that way and, and, and addressed and also educated on what they need to do to keep their house, but also keep the money coming in um, so, that, so that we don't have any, any, any slipping, slippage. Um, and if we do, then, then we address it and handle it, you know, when we can. Um, but, um, you know, it, 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 it's, it's, it's just been harder to keep the blinders on and try to stay focused. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah. that's just the challenge that, uh, that, 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 that we're dealing with and, and, uh, we accept it. I mean, yeah. Um, you have children. I do have children. So um, someone's got to be there with them and yeah, it's just been a challenging time. Right. My wife uh, stays home and, and, and she's there with them and she's become a teacher on top of a mom. <laughs> Um, you know, and, and everything that's going on. And then with the, uh, the police brutality and the, the protests and the riots and, um, you know, it's just, um, you know, I mean, we can talk about that if, if you like. I'm no, I really do want to talk about it because it's been a, um, it's been a, a month of, or a few weeks of learning for me, uh, what okay. I'm in California, so maybe it's different, but I don't see racism but then i have people tell me that even some of the things i say uh might be karen racist type things i i want to understand you know i want to understand that i feel like i was uh educated in the 70s and 80s where our you know we didn't really learn black history and the more i'm learning i'm just appalled i am just you know i just learned about black wall street and Tulsa. you know that's headline news i that Black businesses were burned, and and I just can't believe I didn't know these things. That the Ku Klux Klan was really burning, the or I'm sorry, hanging the people that were business leaders and politicians. And like, why didn't we know this? And why is this kind of thing still going on? At least for me, I feel like I'm starting to see it. But I I really want to understand from you how we can actually make change this time well i'll tell you i'll tell you what the um the, what, what i feel like is the biggest problem is the the division 
and um, how one side doesn't really know about the other side and the depiction that one side is seeing of the other side is not act is not an accurate depiction and so that's the biggest that's the biggest problem is that how you just said like you don't know um about the experiences and things of that nature that happened but that's the whole reason why it's been able to happen for so long because it seems so extreme and it seems so bad but that's regular life for us you know and i'm a type of person that i was taught that you have to figure that that's the way it is and you need to do what you have to do to survive to get home right so you don't you can't trust the police the police are going to mistreat you they're going to challenge you they're going to provoke you they're going to do things of that nature that's kind of what we were taught in my neighborhood growing up in new orleans and i experienced a lot of that just walking to the store getting stopped they take any markings do you have any tattoos do you have any piercings and they take record of you and put you in the book and they kind of like are are harassing you and with the intent of trying to to provoke you um and i feel like now with social media and with this generation there's just a lot more exposure there's a lot more out. There's a lot more people that have voices that didn't have voices before. There's a lot of um, people that could keep people quiet and control things and things of that nature, but you're not able to do that anymore. Um, I feel like the biggest problem is that each side doesn't really know each other. So when that confrontation comes, it's already a sense of uneasiness just because of the perceptions that have been, been put out there. And so what I had to do and I had to develop was my ability to control my actions, but not let my life be guided by, oh, every white person is racist or, or this person is that or this. Because the reality is the, the, the problem is really, and, the, and I feel like what I was, I'll say white people, what people need to understand is black, our problem is with the police, the system. I, I don't I, I don't have a problem. To me, a black person can be racist against blacks just like a white person can be racist against blacks. Because I've had black cops do the same thing to us in the neighborhood, just like we've really? had black. Wow. Yeah. The problem, the problem is not uh, not necessarily white or black. The problem is the system. And, and it's a system that's structured to 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 provoke us to to go to to, to be dead or in jail. Um and, and because a certain population of people have to go there. That's just the reality of it. Just like there's wealthy and then there's poor, there's successful, there's not successful, there's rich. There, everybody has to fit into a, a category, and they are forcing people um, with the with the drug laws and some of the different things that were put into place. I have a bunch of my friends that um, are in prison. Uh, my little brother was in prison for 15 years. He just recently got released. Um, he um, only got caught with about $150 worth of worth of drugs back when he was like 15 or um, oh. then he got in trouble again when he was a little bit older but the the problem is the system um has just been and there's no accountability you know when you when you ask me if i had kids and one thing is that i try to teach my kids that, that they have to be accountable for their actions and so like if you do something you you you, you need to understand um what the what the repercussions of that of, of that are or you, or you get too much power in your hands. And so the police have, have, have stretched, have, their power has been stretched to where they can, I'm, I'm, I'm actually surprised by the reaction, right? Because to me, this, it's just another, I, I'm shocked by the eye opening. I, and, I, and I've tried to figure out why has it been so eye opening? I guess it's because the guy was literally kneeling on his neck and just like killed him on video. But um, we've seen, uh, it, it, it's been going on for a long time. Um, and when you're black and you, especially from the South, you know, I've had my grand, I've been to plantation homes uh, right out the Mississippi River. Um, I've had my grandmother, my grandfather um, educate me and tell me stories about experiences and about how they had to drop out of school in the fourth grade, fifth grade to start working. My grandma had to start working with her mom as a, a cleaner. My grandfather was a landscaper. Um, and so these people are, all people that feel like they have no voice and they have no one to go to because um, the police, as I've learned as I've gotten on the other side of life, is supposed to be there to protect and serve you. But when you're in a, in a neighborhood, you feel uh, really threatened by them just because of the the the, the force. And, and they have a tough job. I, I understand that as well. They have a tough job because there's a lot to it. But that's 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 kind of what you take as a role when you step into that position. Right. 
Mm-hmm. You know, when you want to be a professional athlete, you're going to have to wake up at four in the morning, five in the morning. You want to be a real estate investor and you want to own a company, you're going to have to work. You know, if you want to be a police, then you have to use your judgment and you can't just, you know, yeah. fall back on, I didn't know, or I thought, or just no accountability. So it's it's just gotten worse and worse and worse. And I feel like they're able, they're able to keep the rift in the country because the two sides don't really know each other. You know, the two sides don't really know each other and they look at each other based on the perception instead of instead of um, letting a person show you who they are and then believing them and taking them from there. I mean, based on some of the things I'm learning now, I don't know if it's worse. It's just that we're seeing it now. You that's know? exactly right. Yeah. That's, that's exactly right. And that's, that's why I said I'm, I'm surprised by the reaction because this has been going on for a long time. I mean, a very long time, but I it's get the beginning why. of America. Yes, yeah, the beginning of America. But I mean, even even since from like the slavery times being being over and stuff, you know, it's it's back then it, it was more in your face, right? Mm-hmm. It's more subtle now to where it's it's concealed and covered up with police placing drugs on people. I mean, it's just you know, and that doesn't that doesn't mean that sometimes you know black people aren't wrong or people aren't incorrect or doing things that are illegal, but it's just, it's, it's the, um, it's just not fair, you know, like it's, yeah. it's, uh, it's definitely harassment and, um, uh, 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 abuse of power. I mean, um, abuse but of like, power. Well, I, I think that's, 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 that nails it. And, and I couldn't understand it either. Like, is it just one or two, but, or now it's, it's seeming that, it may be part of the hiring process in, in some cases. So there's, there's so much talk, of course, of defunding the police, and that's a terrifying thought for a lot of people at the same time. I don't know if that's the answer, but an overhaul for sure. You know, I mean, what, what, what's the solution? Well, I, I, think, I think the solution is that these guys just need to be held accountable, to be honest with you. Um, okay. They need to maybe train them better, um, let them know that I feel like, you know, if my daughter knows she can come ask me for orange juice and I'm gonna give it to her, she don't come to me. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so like right. if people know they can get away with things, it, yeah. it, it, it increases the, the likeliness that they're gonna do it. That they will. It's, it's just like the that Catholic Church, you know, it's like, uh, you know, a priest is caught for uh, molesting boys and then they just get sent to another, or at least in the past, to, uh, you know, another place. And that's, you know, same thing. You can't, you can't do that. It's enabling but, them. And, and then, you know, the, 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 the both both people have to have to um both sides have to be accountable for their actions you know mm-hmm. and every um the police are right sometimes i think it has to be honest too the police can be right sometimes and they can be wrong sometimes just like a civilian can be right sometimes and they can be wrong sometimes i think that you have to look at the issue for what it is and be honest about it and not just get caught up in white versus black or this versus this you know and because then then people it, it's, it's hard to generalize a whole entire race like that when people are individuals. Yeah. Um, and so, I, you know, I, I feel like just accountability would be great for some of, for some of these cops that are murdering um, people to, 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 to be held accountable for, for their actions. I mean, it, it would be a good start just so that they would know, hey, if I do this, there's some repercussions that could come that could come from this, you know? It's kind of like why when the police stopped me, I would put my hands on the car when it was 110 degrees in New Orleans and let it sit there for 10 minutes and burn up because I knew if I took them off the car, I could potentially lose my life, oh. right? So I'm not gonna take my hands off the car, you know? It's, 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 it's an extreme example, but it's just an example of your mentality when you know the consequences, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and they don't have any consequences right now. They can kind of do as they want. They've seen plenty of times where people get away from it. They get away, they go to jail, then a year of the road is, is the sentence gets reduced or something happens. The system keeps protecting it. They, they protect themselves. So there's no, there's no reason for them to make an accurate judgment when in the heat of the moment and handle a, a tough scenario the right way. They can just end it the easy way and they can and go home. It's like, well you know, the life has no value, so. Do you know if there's any city that has managed it properly? Um, I don't, I don't. Wow, and I, oh, and I, that's amazing. 
but I, but I don't know. I, but I, that's only because I, I'm not really, I, I kind of accepted that to be the way it kind of is in, 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 in this country, you know, and in, 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 in life. And I just, so I, so I don't feel, cause I can't, I can't, I can't change it. It's kind of like out of my control. I feel like, um, I feel like the generation now, um, we were taught this is how things are. This is what you do to survive. You don't really focus on whether it's per se right or wrong so much, right? You just focus on this is how, this is what you need to do. Mm -hmm. um, or this is how it is. I feel like these, these guys nowadays, they're more still standing up for what's right and what's wrong. And they have a much bigger platform to shine the light on a lot of people that are treating a lot of people the wrong way. And so the masses are finally having a voice when the masses haven't had a voice before because the people, the, the, the power was the voice. Um, and so it's a unique uh, time. Um, uh, it gives me hope. It gives me hope that, you know, everyone has a camera, you know, you just can't get away with stuff anymore. And every building has a camera now. And uh, so hopefully um, we will see change that, uh, that police officers will be held accountable and they will be, the, the world will see right. that that right. is my hope i mean i i can relate only in the sense of uh women crying out rape but no one listening and having no evidence no way to prove it so i don't, I don't know that you can again have a camera you know at all times but um uh, yeah. but that's that's the one way i can i can relate but i do hope that we are moving into a time where uh, finally this will change well, I, I really appreciate that, and um, it's been great just seeing the the um, the the output and the love from from various um, people that you never kind of expect to understand your point because you've been kind of saying it for so long. Mm -hmm. um, like I say, I try not to let that lead my mentality or my life because I don't want to. I feel like a person that sees race or is racist or things of that nature even lets it get into their head that they're at the disadvantage because I go into a situation with an open mind. Um, so I try to not let it cripple my mentality um, or even like realize how relevant and, and, and it really is. But it's easier when I live kind of like the way I live now because you don't see it as much, but it's tough when you live in those, in those neighborhoods and, yeah. and um, you, you know, the neighborhood is already um, flooded with, with, with guns and drugs and other stuff that just kind of been rushed into there and that comes along with poverty and then you you don't have a, the police to rely on and um you got nothing um, you got no protection did you grow up in a neighborhood like that oh yeah really? yeah 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 we're from new orleans louisiana and we grew up in the rough um a rough part and that's why i said it was um talk to us about what we need to do to survive to make it out and we didn't really focus on i mean it bothers you but 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 it's it's, it's all you know um and how did you I turn out so amazing i mean is it your family are you raised with love and discipline or family structure um yeah. family structure um basketball the gift of being able to play basketball helped us a lot um it helped me get out of new orleans and go to college in illinois um, it helped me get away from my neighborhood, get away from that environment. It helped me see a different side of life, which is why I can understand what a disconnect is. Because when you don't see the other side of life, you can't relate. You have nothing to relate on, regardless of what side you're on. You were just mentioning that, you know, you never really focused on it or you, you never really knew much about the history of, you know, and things of that nature. And it was the same way for me of not knowing how easy, right, or how much easy your life can be. Um, when you don't have to worry about leaving every day or walking to the to the corner store to get something and the police running up on you and searching you and making you feel like you're just nothing and disrespecting you and talking down and dirty to you and, and you know you and you're 12 and 13 years old right and you just and, and so they're just kind of like trying to damage your mentality but um, the one thing that you do learn when you are brought up in an environment like that is you have to be tough you you if you don't you're going to fall to the to the to the system and to the traps that they are putting out here for you so if somebody put a trap out there you got to figure out how to get around it how to get over it how to beat it you can't just cry about it's not right fair it's not right you have to understand how to move and how to adapt and have the ability to to make adjustments in order to 
to to to win in the world that you're living in, you know, otherwise you become a, a victim of of the circumstances. And, and regardless of whether it's an excuse or a reason, you're still dealing with the same outcome. So if you don't want that outcome, then you have to do what you need to do to figure it out. And for me, it was basketball that got me out of that environment, got me around some professional coaches and people that could talk to us and, and train us and, you know, put me into a college environment where, you know, all of the stuff that you grow up seeing is no longer the reality, you know, and it's, and it's, and everybody isn't against you and and it's not hard every day. You know, you can just have that off your mind and just go about living, you know, which is something that you just don't have when you, when you, when you're growing up in those areas and the cops are policing them. I mean, you know, I, I, I rarely see cops in my neighborhood now, but we, you, you see cops all day. Um, growing up where I grew up at all day, you know, and you could So be, if, if, if there were you, it sounds like you were more scared of them than any other, any criminal on, on the street. Yeah, because the streets have a code. Huh. Game, it's, it's a code that says the game is cold, but it's fair, right? So it's fair. All we want is fairness, you know, at least in the streets, it's fair. You know, um, when, you, when you're in the streets and stuff, people don't normally hurt innocent people. You know, the consequences may be a little bit rougher because the tolerance level is, is, is lower. So if you disrespect somebody or you do something that you really didn't have any business doing, the consequences that you may have to deal with may be a little shrewd. But they're not, they're, 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 there's a lot of great older elderly people, great families. There are a lot of people that live in those neighborhoods that um, don't get messed with or that, or that people don't do anything to. The police harass anybody they don't know whether you're they just know you're black and you're in the neighborhood and so you they know you're poor and so they know that you don't have the means or the the, the education or the, or the or the access to certain things in order to to or the voice to um to do anything to them so yeah i'm way more afraid of the police i i've never called 911 in my life i'll tell you that I, I still to this day um i was we were just taught uh that they're not they're, yeah. they're not they're not for it they're not i don't want to say for us they're, they're not on they're your not team. protecting you're, you're not taught it but you're you you see it you get treated that way by them and that's why i say it's a it's a it's a police thing it's not even just a white cop thing it's 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 and it's not every cop it's not every cop i hate talking in generalizations but mm-hmm. it's a it's a cultural type mm-hmm. of thing that even the good ones can't change it because they're only the cops it's once you go above them to the courts and the judges and the all the stuff behind it that allows that to be oh, the way it is. All that too. Oh man. And so you can't win. You know what I mean? You get, oh, you man, get, you get judged. Heartbreaking. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it, it's tough. It's a lot of pain. You know, it's a lot of, uh, you know, for, and, and it's from people that you really love, you know, your grandmothers and your grandfathers and you, you have to live with these people every day and you have to hear stories about how they've been treated. Um, you have to deal with certain things and you have to get talked to by your parents about controlling your anger. You have to get control, talk to about, um, you know, even though you feel disrespected. So, so on one hand, you're getting told to not let nobody disrespect you because you have to stand up and fight for yourself because you live in the neighborhood where you have to fight for everything because it, you know, if, if, you, if you show weakness, the people in the neighborhood potentially might, you know, pronounce on you. But then you're also having to learn humility and tuck your tail um, when... <laughs> It comes up with a cop because, you know, so it's so it's so it's it's it's, it's a lot, it's, and that's what I'm saying. They make the path hard. They don't have, to, you know, if I if I say, okay, Kathy, we're gonna race, and I start off and not running, and then you start off and I got a car right here, I got a big pothole right here, I got a six foot hurdle that you can't, you know, it's like, oh, you have more hurdles. It's gonna take you longer to to get through the obstacles because you have. So they they just they're just hoping that you know you fall into one of those one of those traps and then the consequences uh, once they put you in they give you sentences of 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 you know 10 15 20 30 40 year sentences for crimes that are just ridiculously minimal um man i did not so, know that yeah yeah and it's 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 it's, it's really worse than what this is even exposing, you know, it's getting a lot of attention and that's great. But the, the depth of the, the depth of it is, is, is pretty far, honestly. And um, I hope that finally we can get to a point where there's some help if it's from, you know, just 
just at least hearing people and, and I'm just grateful that people are starting to understand that it's that it is real. It's not made up. You know, people you don't you don't want to tell people you're getting mistreated. No. <laughs> that's not that's not prideful. That's not that, that that's that's not something you make up. You make up good stories or like stuff that's, you know, great, right? You don't want to make up I don't want to make up about how to what the police did to us back in the day or how they, you know, tripped hit us or pushed us or harassed us or put us on cars or push us up against stuff. I mean that's that's as a man, that's that that that's that's tough. Yeah. You know, that's tough because you you know, so it's people well, it comes across as a victim or weak. Yeah, you can't Yeah, you come across as a victim or weak, you know, and, and so every when, when people are sharing their experiences, you know, if, if I tell you something and you tell me it offends you, I shouldn't say, well it shouldn't offend you. I should understand that, hey, there's a reason why it offends you. Mm-hmm. And so I should take that into account and realize that if it offends you or if you are feeling that way about it and you're rightfully, you know, you're not just saying it, then, then there's some credence to it, you know, and for so long, it's just been blown off. And that's what's so frustrating um, is that, you know, you just, you, you just blown off and, and. Um, yeah. Not- I mean, I can just tell you from my perspective, I, I just really thought it was a, a one-off kind of thing. And, uh, but then we saw it and the world saw it. We saw right. murder. We saw first degree murder or what it looked like. I mean, it was, there was no denying that. So, so that's, that's a great point. That's what I was wanting to ask you. Like what, go ahead, tell me a little bit more about that. Like, cause I'm really intrigued by the amount of, by the response to it. So I'm kind of wondering like, what was the trigger? I can just say for me, um, I think it's kind of easier to justify, like, like, let's face it, I would be afraid to walk through an all black neighborhood. I would not feel safe. So there's reasons why we, you know, stay separate, I think, and don't know each other, like, like you said. So for someone like me who isn't familiar at all with the way you were raised, uh, I would I would think that maybe in that moment, the police officer felt threatened and didn't know what to do and was right. trigger happy. So it's, right. it's kind of like you almost forgive them like, oh, they have such a difficult time. I would be afraid to go in those neighborhoods. They must be afraid. And then when right. their fear has them trigger happy and trying to protect themselves. So I think that's been the rationale. In this, in this case, this is the first time I saw an incident where it was totally unnecessary, right? It, right. it was, it, there was people telling this guy, get off him. And he, so it was, it was very blatant and, and right. not a, a, a moment of fear for the police officer wondering if his life was in danger. I think that's the right. difference because that's right. the way we justify it is, well, yeah, I mean, if I were standing there in the dark and someone's got a gun pointed at me or that or something I think is a gun, I might do that too. I might shoot not knowing. I'm trying to protect myself. So I think for for many of us, it was like, oh, no, 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 there was none of that involved. This was cold hearted murder on camera with someone knowing the cameras were there, still thinking they could get away with it. That was mind blowing. That's awesome. And that's, that's, that's very important. And that's the, that's why, um, as I I like to tip, I kind of focus on what we can do on our side as far as black people. And that's, that's why I've always said, you know, know your rights, make sure you have all of your stuff in order, um, make sure you, you know, respect the police the way that they're supposed to be respected. There's certain things that you have to do as a person as well, because you can't justify the reaction that somebody gives, even if you weren't expecting that act, that reaction, right? Once you run from the cops or once you do something like that, you're opening yourself up to, for more things to kind of happen. People get into, well, they shouldn't have, they shouldn't have handled it that way but you really can't control how they handle it. But what this was, was just an extension of the abuse of power. This was just an extreme action that took it further than normal. And so I could understand why it opened people's eyes up, but it's a, the, the reaction to it from the, from the community is because it's an underlying problem that doesn't always end in murder, but it still affects you close to the same way when every time you leave your house you're getting harassed and you're getting messed with and and a lot of times i could have been in a lot of different positions if my mom and dad didn't teach me about how to handle the police and how to 
what to do, what to say, what not to say. Even if you go to jail, we'll come get you out. Don't argue with them. Don't fight with them. They plant drugs on you. It's okay. Don't resist. All of the different wow. things that you have they to- They plant drugs on you? Oh, <sighs> big time. A lot of times. I just, A lot of times. Wow. I'm so grateful that you came from that world. You know that world, that you've become who you are, a very successful businessman, proving, improving neighborhoods. I, I hope that you can get this message out. I really Thank hope. You. And then that we can find a solution. I mean, I don't know that defunding the police is the solution. I, mean, do I, don't, think that's, I don't think that's a solution. I, I, think, I think that's a horrible idea, personally. Yeah. I think uh, that the police... Reform. Reform. Yeah. yeah. And accountability. I think, that, I think that sometimes the other problem is that people don't understand there's, there's, to make stuff work is, all, is, is unique. It's never just one way or the other way. So like, just because the police have a problem, it's not like defund them and cancel it all out. And that's, that's an overreaction. You know, you need to really hone in on the problem. The problem isn't that we have a police force. The problem is the police force aren't being held accountable and doing, to doing their job. Yeah. I have, I, have, I have to hold all of my staff here at the office. They have a job to do. We have jobs to do. We, should, we need to do our job. Regardless of what it is, that's what you signed up for. That's what you need to do. The police need to just understand they need to do their job. And citizens need to understand they need to do their part. If the police does this, then you act this way, you act this way. And everybody do their part and then and then it'll be it, it'll be it'll be okay. The the, the, the structure, the system is, is good. You need police. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> that was what I was thinking. I was like, if you don't have police, man, you're gonna just have the we're gonna have a situation where you got cartels you run the show. Yeah, yeah, it's gonna be much worse if there's no police, you know. So we don't need to defund them. They just need to do their jobs a little bit better and be held to a higher standard and weed out the bad cops. Weed out the bad cops. You know, I think that a lot of times you got to get cops that are used to working with people in those areas, you know, because if you have a cop that come from your area that's just watching TV and watching the news and all they see is the bad stuff that's being placed out there about blacks and things of that nature, they don't know how to interact or how to deal with these people, these kids. And then when they run up on the kid, the kid don't know because all he has seen and heard is all the stories of his people and his parents about police brutality and abuse and all of the stuff that police do. So he got a messed up image in his head about the white cop. So right when they meet, there's already friction there when it may not even really need to be. You know, so another thing may be getting some people in neighborhoods that are comfortable working in those neighborhoods and understand that there's a heightened level because there is you know, drug activity, gang activity, same stuff that's in every area, right? But it's more prominent there because, you know, they, 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 uh, there's, there's reasons behind that, even how they, you know, systematically build projects and big project housing and put a bunch of people on top of each other and then put drugs in there. So, you know, it's natural. Certain things you can do to create or cause a scenario. Um, but the cops, I think cops being from the area and having some type of relations in the community in the Obviously, community, not volunteering, being a part of it, getting to know the neighborhood. Yeah. yeah. Right. Come to some functions, you know. Um, don't just, you know, like if I live in Carmel, don't, don't live in Carmel and go down to downtown and you're, and you're a cop in the downtown district and then you drive back out to Carmel and you live out there, you know, because you might deal with some, the different crowd of people. Yeah. And so it may, you may be uneasy for, for reasons that, that, aren't, that aren't necessary. Mm -hmm. um, and and so you know, it's, I think it's accountability on both sides. You know, I'm I'm a I, I I'm I'm not one that says one side is all the way right or all the way wrong. I know that there's good police, um, just like there's bad police, and then there's innocent citizens getting killed, just like there's citizens that might have did something that's out of the ordinary or that's wrong that need to be killed. If you run from the cops being through the day, I have kids. I don't want somebody running from the police going 100 and some miles an hour through streets and all of that stuff. I want the police to stop them. And that's what I think the message gets mixed up right now is we want the police. We want it to be, we, we just want it to be fair. We just want them to be, we just want it to be fair. You know, we don't want to, I don't, we don't want to slant it in our direction. We don't want favors. We don't want handouts. We just want it to be fair. That's, that's it. That's, 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 that's fair. <laughs> that's a fair request. That's fair, right? Like that. How interesting for you to live in Carmel, uh, Indi Indiana. I'm from New Orleans. Pretty right. white, I'm guessing. 
What, Very white. <laughs> what's it like to raise your kids there? It must be a trip. Uh, it is. It is a trip. They, uh, but they don't know it. They don't know any. They don't. I, I don't make it. A, I don't make it an issue with them, really. Um, you know, we just kind of. Um, I spend a lot of time with my, with my, with, with my family when I'm at home, and we kind of have a closeness uh, with us. She has friends from her school that she goes to school with and stuff like that. Um, and so they, they really don't know. Like I said, my kids don't really know, but they can tell that other kids know because she'll like speak to kids and they won't speak and their parents look and she'd be like, daddy, why didn't you speak? I said, oh baby, don't worry about it. Right. I don't make it an issue with them. How like my parents put it into me to make me conscious of it. Um, because she don't have to deal with it as much. What I'll try to focus on is educating her on how to carry herself and how to carry herself the right way when circumstances happen so that the outcome does become right. I won't necessarily tell them, hey, this could happen, you could be killed. I don't want to put all of that into their head because then it makes them on edge. And you can be on edge when a cop approaches you and they could take that as a threat, right? Because mm-hmm. there's been so many things where everything you do, they take it as a threat, right? When you when <laughs> When in reality, you're scared for your life. You know what I mean? You're not, yeah. you're not, you're, you know, but they don't know. So I try to focus on just making sure that my kids' minds are very, very, very strong and that they are grounded and that they, that they understand they have to be in control of the, of the scenarios and that they don't base their decisions off of others or their, or their actions off of others. They kind of have a plan in their place and they understand what they're supposed to do and what's expected of them. And they do their part. And that's all they can control. And whether somebody's white, black, green, purple, yellow, I don't care. You know, I got... I, it's some black people that I'm not friends with no more. I don't, I, you know, because I don't like the way they do. I didn't fire a lot they of black are, yeah. I didn't fire white kind of. I'm, I'm, about, I'm about what you can do, <laughs> and, and that's it. It's the people. It's people, and so that's how I want them to lead their life. It's about people. It's not. It's not as much as, you know. It's not about all of that. For, yeah, for it's who who you are on the inside. I, I, I don't remember. I can't remember where we were. Maybe it was Detroit. Uh, huh. I can't remember where we were, but there was a country concert. Okay. Oh, we were in, uh, <laughs> wait a minute. We were in Florida. Florida. We it was, no, it was Florida. a country. It was, uh, it was all <laughs> it was white. A, it was all it white. It was rock. It was like a rock band. Rock. But it yeah. wasn't an actual band. It was like some guys acting like the band, I think. Oh, it was a cover. Yes, it was a cover band. <laughs> it was a cover band. For very, oh, it was all white. And you know, there's, you know, you guys, you're like towering above everybody. The only, only black guy. Only I'm black like, guy like, do you feel, you know, uncomfortable? Cause I would feel really uncomfortable in an all black concert, I think. And right. no, nope, you're like, what, what? Didn't even notice. <laughs> yeah. no, I'm, I'm okay. I don't, I don't, and that, I don't, I don't let that, I don't, I try, you know, well, for one, cause I'm not, I'm not intimidated. Like you said, I am pretty big, so I can, I can handle myself. Yeah, when it comes to that, but like, you know, and it was a, it was a, it, it. I would have never went because I, I didn't know the band, I didn't know, but it was about going with you guys and, and the experience and all of that, and I enjoyed myself, and that's the, that's the. It was thing Queen. It was Queen. It was Queen. <laughs> it was Queen. That's right. That was my first was time funny. hearing any of those songs. Well, a few they had a few popular ones that I did know, just from basketball games and stuff. But, um, yeah, that was interesting, man. That was that was interesting. I was the only black person in there and it was, it was the only one and and you were just not phased um uh-huh. you know our daughter uh was raised in a pretty very white community and uh-huh. uh, one day i came to school and and i noticed she had this just group of people around her and there was only only like one white girl one blonde girl and the rest she had chinese friends and hispanic friends and black friends and i mean this they there it was hard to find right it was right. very limited number. Right. Right. And after school, I picked, you know, I picked it up and I said, that was amazing. You have such a diverse group of friends in, in this community. And she goes, what, do you, what does diverse mean? And I said, well, you know, friends of, of, of color. And she's like, what kind of color? What color? Yeah. <laughs> she had awesome. no idea what That's I was awesome. talking about. Anyway, awesome. I think That's there's awesome. hope for our future because of our kids. I, I, I was just about to say that, Kathy. Mm. They, they, they are really getting out of the like I said, we were raised, this is the way things are. Yeah. They're they're more so like, no, this isn't right. And they have a platform that we never had, right? Like when I was raised, when I was growing up, if I had an idea, I could only tell it to my mom or my uncles, my grandma, and they could all tell me, no, you, that's wrong, right? Now, now these kids have ideas, they have feelings, they can find support in ways that 
we've never had support. You've never been able to get that support. You, 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 you your message, your, you know, you, you couldn't reach as many people or, or even be reached by as many people. So they're connecting at a rate and on a level that, I mean, it's great. They're standing up for, for what's right. And um, yeah. they're having an impact. You know, I, I, I hate when I see the protests turn into rioting and, 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 and destroying businesses and stuff because that takes the focus to me off the matter and the issue at oh, hand yeah. and it makes them focus on now you're, you can't be fighting for right and doing wrong. Yeah. Right? Like that kills your whole argument. Exactly. Right? You can't be out yeah. trying to protest for right and you're still in liquor out of liquor store. No, you're, you're a criminal. You need to go to jail, right? Like you're not protesting for you know, you're out there trying to take advantage of scenarios, kind of just like what the cops are doing, taking advantage of some of the scenarios and the positions that they're put in. So I agree with you. We we have a, we have hope because because these kids are um, they're trailblazing. They are they are they are they they're not stopping and they are standing up for what we've been kind of just taking um, mm. for for a while, for a long time. So oh, that's that's a great way to end the interview. I. We'll hold that positive thought. Well, thank you so right. much. I'm sure you got some some things to do, some houses to buy, and <laughs> got some people to pay. It's Friday. <laughs> oh, awesome! All right, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. All right, Kathy, nice speaking with you. Thank you for having me. Okay. You bet. And uh, um, hopefully, we get to see you at one of our upcoming events when when people can actually gather again. No, we get back out again, right? It'd be, yep. it'd be It'll be um, definitely appreciated after going through all of this. So. Absolutely. All right. You take care. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. And thank you for joining me here on The Real Wealth Show. If you'd like to get in touch with Mike or any of our other property teams across the country who find discounted properties, fix them up to rent-ready condition, get a qualified tenant, and sell the tenanted property to investors, you can get that information at realwealthshow.com. That's realwealthshow.com. Thanks for joining me today.